Today, this is an honor to have uh, on the guest or on the podcast again. You're not on the guest. You are the guest on the podcast for the third time, Dr. Stuart McGill. How are you doing today, Doc? I'm fabulous, Pete. How are you? I am doing well. Now, you're saying you've been retired for a few years, but what did you study for when you were in, in the university? What was your primary focus of study? When I became a young professor in 1986, uh, the opening question for us was, how does the spine work? Nothing more complicated than that. How does the spine work? And we uh, created a laboratory to measure loads on the tissues inside people using various technologies doing different things. Uh, we would have them doing occupational work, uh, sports, uh, et cetera. And then we realized that we had to really understand what loads do to the tissues. So we developed a, an imaging suite and a cadaveric laboratory where we took spines and created the injuries. So now we could take the loads that we saw people creating. We knew from epidemiological work, the clusters of specific types of back injuries. And then we actually applied them to tissues and watched them uh, unfold or create what we call the cascade of damage that goes. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of a cascade. Um, if you lay in bed in the same position, after time, you will become uncomfortable. If you don't move and you stay in that position, you will become very painful. And if you don't move and you, you, you stay in that position, you will actually develop bed sores. So you went from discomfort to pain to injury, tissue breakdown. So that was a summary of the process that we went through. And we just went back and forth. And then about 10 years after that, we developed the uh, experimental clinic. And that was uh, so interesting. We started off with a two hour assessment of people coming into the clinic and my colleagues would look at me and say, two hours for a back pain consult, what are you going to do? You know, Pete, after the end of the first year, we sh switched it to three hours. It took oh, wow. that long to start with inviting a, uh, a pained person in and just invite them tell me your story. And they would tell us all kinds of stories. No one had ever given them the opportunity before. And we were able to link what were the impediments as to why they never got better before. What were some of the things that were assisting, thwarting their success. Uh, and then it became our questions that we researched in the other two laboratories actually came from clinical patients. And then uh, clinicians would say, you know, we've got this very difficult patient. They became our next experiment. So they drove our research. So it was a beautiful synergy back and forth. But that was the large uh, description of what we did at the university over those 32 years. Um, but now I just, uh, this is my home uh, <laughs> clinic. And uh, I just see uh, usually high performance athletes now but we still see the odd struggling uh, patient as well. But uh, as I said in the opening, I'm trying to retire. I, I wish <laughs> people would stop having disabling back pain, but unfortunately uh, they're, they're not being well retreated. Well, well I, I don't know if I've ever shared with you. I kind of look at the, the fitness industry Stu, as being kind of like a, the mafia where you have certain leaders and you have, I consider myself kind of like a, a conciliary because I work between different groups of people but I would definitely put you up at the at one of the, the the heads of a family when you look at like performance and back pain. So just like in a, in a mafia movie, you try to get out, but they keep pulling you back in into it. And for listeners, what you can't see if you're listening to this on on audio is he has a whole squat cage and he has a whole exercise room behind him. Now, one of the things that, that popped in my mind, Stu, as you're discussing your lab was how did your study like. When you started a number of years ago, you didn't have computer modeling and 3D imaging. How did that change your ability to study the spine as you, as you progress through that? Because back in the day, you probably had to go with the actual static look at the structures. But then as computer modeling came along, were you able to use that in, in your studies? And did that play a role in how you study the human body? 
Very much so. We developed the first uh, computer models of the spine. And in fact, uh, there was a review done uh, maybe 10 years ago. And even 10 years ago, they said at that time, uh, the Waterloo model, which I uh, directed the development of, was the most sophisticated, anatomically detailed, biofidelic model of the spine, uh, even at that time. And it was based on, we would measure in three dimensions the person moving. So you can imagine uh, if, if you look at the bicep action in a neutral elbow, the bicep contracts, creates the torque and, and creates the bicep, the elbow motion. But when you get to the end range of motion, it is the bones and the connective tissues that are now responsible for defining the load. So posture migrates loads from one tissue to another. So the uh, motion part of the model would help us distribute loads between passive tissues and bony stops and the disc and intra-abdominal pressure. And then we used electromyography, which is measures the electrical profile of a muscle contracting. And from that, we could uh, calibrate to force. Uh, then we would, uh, as imaging came along, we would take an MRI image or a CAT scan, as it was known back in those days, and we would serially stack them and create that person's three-dimensional spine. So now we had a virtual spine of them. Hmm. As they actually moved, uh, they would use strategies to create stability, to create a prime movement, etc. Uh, and uh, some people created wise strategies and some created very poor strategies. Or someone might say, is that a good exercise? Well, hold on. Um, let's test it and see if it creates a stress concentration increasing the risk of injury when it isn't necessary. Uh, so it was that very sophisticated computer modeling that was the beginning of it. And then we knew what stresses we could apply to cadaveric spines to see uh, what uh, injuries would um, uh, ensue. But because it was such a, a mathematical computer driven situation, for the first time, we were able to ask, well, what is spine stability? How do you measure it? Is it even an issue with uh, people? So anyway, yeah, that's a wise question. And it uh, certainly um, gave us a lot of unique insights. And then why, I mean, and also the other thing, I'm, I'm doing a whole series on on strength training this month, which is why I'm, I'm so pleased you could join, join the podcast. But why is it so, when we look at strength training, Nobody goes into the gym to strengthen their spine, right? There's no there's no specific spinal exercise when you look at, like you mentioned, the biceps or, or a quadriceps or a glute. The, why is it so important to understand the spine and to study the spine in terms of looking at it, at the role it plays in exercise? I mean, why is it that, that the spine plays such an important role? Well, I don't know, Pete. I would say every one of our patients and athletes goes very specifically uh, to to develop uh, spine fitness and strength and all the rest of it. So I'll debate you on that one. <laughs> but, um, well, uh, I see a model across the room, which I could walk over and get. Uh, but maybe I'll just take the model that's in hand here. The spine is a very curious structure in that it's a flexible rod. Now, what kind of engineer would build a flexible rod up our torso and then ask it to bear compressive loads and help us to pick up our grandchildren. You wouldn't design a flexible rod. Can you imagine stacking up oranges or Oreo cookies or something and putting a book on top and that would just fly apart. So the spine is this very curious, unique structure that allows you to bend and tie your shoes and uh, have sex, as I know, which was one of your previous conversations and, and allows all of these kinds of things. And and the very next moment, you must pick up your grandchild, or you might want to do a farmer's carry, or you're a fireman, and you've just extricated a body from a, a car wreck, and now you begin out uh, doing a heavy pull and then a fireman's carry, very literally. So now you must have turned that flexible rod into a very rigid beam to allow it to accomplish that task. So uh, this is the magic of it all, to know when to stiffen and stabilize and increase load bearing, uh, and what you must do to uh, decrease uh, uh, certain types of pain triggers. May I go to this model that I just showed you? Absolutely, and yeah, for listeners, yeah, he's holding up a, a model of, of a pelvis 
and the lumbar spine. So I'll add in a little bit about the about what you're doing, uh, but but you can always catch this on the YouTube on the All About Fitness Podcast YouTube channel to see this demonstration. Right. These models are the most biofidelic model of spine uh, pain triggers known. They're made by a company called Dynamic Disc Designs. When you let a little bit of air out of your car tire, the tire bulges, hmm. and it also is sloppy on the road. So it's stiffness that controls the car uh, athleticism. Stiffness is what the body uses to control movement. So if you don't have stiffness, you, you couldn't even stand. You would just uh, collapse. So um, I'm showing a pelvis and three spinal segments. The top joint is normal. The bottom joint or disc is normal. This one has been damaged and it's lost a little bit of stiffness. It has a little bit of an end plate fracture and a little bit of a disc bulge. Now I'm going to apply a twisting torque. Watch what happens, Pete. Do you see how the majority of the movement takes place at the joint that lost its stiffness? So you can imagine if you tear a knee ligament, for example, or strain it, the doc or the physio will do a drawer test on your knee testing shear. Well, I'm just applying a shear load to the spine and you see the same joint laxity and that will cause pain very specifically from that level. So now you see the muscles act just like they do at the knee or any other joint, but it's even more uh, important at the spine to arrest those micro movements and reduce the pain. Now, here's the, a curious thing for high performance athletes. Um, what I would suggest you do is you go to uh, the world's strongest man, uh, I think it was either 2019 or 2018, the one in Mogadishu, Africa. And one of the tasks was to squat 750 pounds on this jig for repetitions. Uh, and uh, I think the winner got 17 reps. Go and watch that video because you will see that Look at the rep before they failed. So say one of the athletes could do 12 reps. Mm -hmm. The failure occurred on the 11th rep. And what would happen is you would see on the 11th rep, the hips would slide a bit to the side or the spine. You could actually see that micro movement that I'm talking about. Here's what the brain does. Just as, as your brain detects an unstable knee and causes you to limp, and it shuts down the neural drive. You can't send full strength to your knee. Your brain won't let you. And so it is with your spine. It mm. shuts down neural drive, and it's the next rep that you fail on. So you start to see now how motor control and understanding of injury mechanisms and then arresting those micro movements and what particular exercises do all of this is the key to creating endurance and resilient high performance strength with no pain and see that's i want to get there and we'll talk about your model in a second and this is so important for listeners i really want you to kind of pay attention to to what dr miguel is talking about and the reason why i say this is because a lot of people i see go into a gym or go into a fitness facility and they'll do things like sit in a machine they'll push and pull a lever and they'll, they won't really be mindful of, of their spine and what they're doing with it. And that's why I asked that question in the beginning is because people might think they're working on a chest day or an arm day or a leg day, but they don't realize that everything attaches to that rod that you, de that you described. That in my opinion or my understanding, that's kind of like our foundation of movement. And that's where I wanted to kind of be able to go with that. The conversation is why is it so important for us to kind of work from the inside out? And I know that you've done some studies on, I've read some of your research on strongman training. Why, why is studying the strongman athlete so important for understanding proper spinal mechanics? Excellent question. Before I set up the strongman specific answer, can I establish a principle? Absolutely. And that principle is proximal stiffness creates distal athleticism and that's the law of a linkage so consider a backhoe which is a linked machine that digs earth uh, the operator in the tractor puts down what are called stabilizers and locks the cab of the tractor into the ground that allows the arm to dig earth in a very athletic fashion failure to put down the stabilizers when he digs earth the whole tractor moves and you're, you're not very effective at pulling earth so now i'm going to create a push force 
let's use my big bench press muscle. Let's say we could bench press 400 pounds. Of course I can't, but let's say we could. I, I, I will tell you, Pete, I once bench pressed 300, believe it or not, in this old body. <laughs> well, I believe but, it. But uh, anyway, uh, let's say I could bench press 400 pounds. Let's say I really develop an athletic pec major, my bench press muscle distal to the ball and socket joint now. So it's distal athleticism flexes the arm to create the push. But look what it does proximally. It connects to my rib cage. When I use the uh, pec major to push proximally, it just collapses my body into my shoulder. Now that's not a very effective push, but if I stiffen down proximally, and don't allow movement. In other words, my core arrests the movement. 100% of that bench press muscle can now go into creating the athletic uh, push. So it's a law of a linkage and our body is a linkage where you must establish proximal stiffness to unleash distal mobility. Wiggle your finger as fast as you can. You had to stiffen your wrist. If you yeah. didn't, there's no way you could have created that. So this is the law of a linkage. And uh, you found the person who didn't turn his phone off. There we go. <laughs> so now let's go and answer your strongman question. So we measured a strongman competitor who won the super yoke. Now the super yoke, they get under a yoke and they have to see who can carry the yoke the furthest. Now consider when I stand on one leg, let's say my left leg, the force vector comes up my leg, but it come, must shear across my pelvis and go up my spine, agreed? So there's a step there. So when I stand on my left leg, gravity is trying to drop my pelvis down because that's my swing leg side. So the gait biomechanists, the experts who, who measure gait mechanics say, well, your hip abductors. These muscles on your hip, on the outside of your hip, allow you to keep a level pelvic platform and allow you to walk. Well, the thing is, they only uh, look at and measure from the waist on down, but I'm mm. a spine guy and I know that's not going to work. <laughs> so when you measure a world-class strongman competitor, now let's learn the lesson from them. Is it really their hip abductors that allows them to take a step? And we tur it turned out it isn't. On this one fellow I'm referencing, and, and he was in our strongman carry article, we measured hip abduction strength to be 500 Newton meters. But when we measured world-class yoke carries, he needed 750 Newton meters to win. Wow. In other words, he only had 500 Newton meters of strength. He needed 750 to win. Where did it come from? You've all heard the expression, a stronger core makes the rest of you stronger. Well, not too many people can explain that, but we can. And here's an example that we measured with world-class strongmen. He plants the left leg, the right hip is collapsing down. He only has 500 Newton meters of hip abduction strength. It's quadratus lumborum and the obliques on the other side that holds the pelvic platform up. So if he only had that muscles, he would slowly keel off to the side. So that's why they take short steps and glide like this, but they carry it with their frontal plane strength. In other words, quadratus lumborum and the obliques strengthen all other athletic uh, effects. So there's an example of uh, what we would learn from measuring uh, a very special form of athlete, someone who has to carry the most load of any human in the world. When you measure an Olympic sprinter, uh, a top fighter, uh, a golfer, they all give you insights into very special athleticisms. And if I can say something, uh, Stu, because I, yeah, I hear you talking and somebody might be listening or watching and go, well, I'm not going to walk around with 750 pounds on my shoulders. But the reason why I think your research is so important for, for my work, and I don't work with those type of strongman athletes, but I do have people that are picking up a three-year-old child. I do have people that are picking up a, a three or, you know, two or three-year-old grandchild. And so understanding that force distribution is so important. And, and this goes for everybody, whether you're an athlete or you just are, are puttering around the house, you need to understand how all these muscles come together. I mean, isn't that correct? Absolutely. Why does Honda 
or Mercedes-Benz race F1 race cars. And the reason is they learn what's optimal so they can bring it down. Th so the, the Honda Civic uses gear change technology, hard one on the F1 track in their Civic car. So uh, yeah, that's, that's an excuse that is intolerable to me when people say, oh, I don't need to understand high performance athletics because I don't work with that population. You learn what is humanly optimal. So. Here's a case in point. Go to the neurology ward of a children's hospital and you might find a small child who has a paralyzed quadratus lumborum, a core muscle on the right-hand side of their spine. They can't even walk. So they tell me that, what, the core isn't important to walk? If you stand on your right leg, no problem. You can have left swing. But when you stand on your left leg, the quadratus lumborum that holds the pelvis up it collapses. So they walk with this collapsing gait like that. So we learned that from world-class strongman, but it unlocks the secret of a child struggling to walk. So that's just an excuse when people say they can't understand uh, studying high-performance athletes. They're what I, what intellectually I lazy. Well, and what I've, when I agree with you, because I've told people for years and for listeners and, and, and viewers of the podcast, the reason why I want to interview experts like, like Stu is because they work with the highest performing athletes. And you have to understand, and I love that analogy of the F1, right? Because the way I've always looked at it is if it works for somebody getting paid 10, 20, 30 million dollars, some ridiculous amount of money for playing a sport, then my clients should be doing the same methodology in the gym. You know, they might not be competing on a field or on a pitch or on an ice rink, but don't you want to train with that same high level performance? Don't you want that same kind of, of mindset going into your exercise program? That's why I think this is so critical for people to understand that the body is a whole and we need to train it as a whole, just like we would with any, any top level athlete. Can I give another example of a, Please, of, a, of a life that was changed by just a sound training principle? Uh, on occasion, I'm asked to come to various hospitals and would I assess three different patients on a stage in front of the surgeons and fellows and physios and the hospital staff. So I was at this one uh, hospital, the first uh, athlete they brought out was a big strength athlete, fair enough. The second one was an older woman, uh, probably in about her late 70s, and she had a disruptive gait pattern walking out onto the stage. And uh, she said, and, and she was obviously very psychologically distraught. Mm. And uh, I said, well, well t tell me about yourself. Tell me why you're here. You know, Pete, she never mentioned her pain. She said, and she started to cry. And it, it came out that her physical therapist had told her that as she gets off the toilet, she's so shaky that the therapist is afraid she's going to fall. No one will find her. She'll be left there. Oh, and that wow. she has to leave her home and go to a patient care facility. And I, I looked at her and I said, really? Um, could someone bring me a stool? So they brought over the stool and I said, I forget what her name was, say it was Daphne or something like that. I said, Daphne, there's the toilet. Would you sit on the toilet for me? And she just, in a very incompetent athletic pattern, plopped onto the toilet. And then to get off the toilet, her knees were together. Remember, she'd seen the physical therapist, her knees were together, her feet were in front of her, and she struggled and, and, and I had to hold her so she didn't collapse on the floor. I will reveal that this hospital was in England. They don't know baseball, but they know how to play cricket. Yeah. And I said, do you know that posture that the outfielders in cricket adopt? They put their hands on their thighs and they do this. Now we can, in America, you would call this a shortstop uh, position waiting for the play. And then I showed her how to change the curve of her back to make all of the pain go away. And then I showed her a leaning tower through the ankles, you know, just basic training 101, how to carry more weight down her arms and push her shoulders away from her ears to trick her into creating optimal stiffness. And then I said, don't lift and stand up with your back push down on your hands and pull your hips through. Just think about pulling your hips mm. through. You know, Pete, she did it perfectly, but there was a little bit of a waiver. And I said, I, I showed her how to grip with her toes and her heels now and make what we call a big foot. Now with a big foot, now get the leaning tower right, 
pull your hips through. In other words, perfect squat training. Then I said, there's the toilet. Now, spread your feet apart, go down and play cricket, and slowly lower onto the toilet. Now, to get off the toilet, you've just created an impossible lever because you can't get out over your knees. Spread your knees apart, pull your feet underneath you, sniff some air, lead with your chest, lean forward through the hips, now pull your hips through. And I didn't say another thing, Pete, and she did it again. In other words, I took basic Olympic lifting 101 and applied it to her. And then I looked at her dossier and I said, you've been to a lot of physical therapists and not one of them has shown you weightlifting 101. Hmm. And a big grin was on her face. And she said, I said, you know, what's up with you? Because I knew what she was going to say. She says, I don't have to leave my home, do I? <laughs> That she can you stay, know, I mean, isn't that so do you, important? Do you, do, do you know that those tough surgeons were crying? Oh, wow. To see what they had been leaving on the table. Think about that. It well, was an enormous moment. And that brings to mind because as you're demonstrating that, as you're demonstrating standing up, the one thing that absolutely is nails on my chalkboard, Stu, is absolute nails on my chalkboard is when I hear somebody say, tighten your core or squeeze your core, or, activate your core, and you're in a standing position. Because what I've learned, and I don't know if I got it from you or, or if I heard it from some, I'm sure, I'm sure I heard it from somebody else, but if I try to squeeze my core and try to squat, I can't move because the, as the muscles shorten, they pull the bones together and then they take away space. Or if I try to quote unquote, tighten my core, it makes it hard to walk or move around. It would be, you demonstrated using your feet. How important are your feet and hands, and I'm talking about the distal, the, the, the palms of the hands, how important are the feet and hands for being involved for creating entire body stability? Well, the answer is uh, it depends. I can tell you one thing that it's incredible the number of highly trained people who come here to BackFit Pro and they have what I call computer hands, mm -hmm. very small underdeveloped hands. And all they ever do is handle a barbell. Uh, if they got some manual athleticism and pulled on ropes and really developed a good set of grippers, they would then be able to express all the rest of the athleticism. And it's the same for the feet. Um, you know, I'll say, uh, can you uh, just just pull a one handed, uh, I don't know, say a, uh, a good morning kettlebell pull? If they fall over, uh, what good is their athleticism? And they want to squat uh, 500 pounds. Give me a break. If you can't control the line of drive when you're under 500 pounds, or let's pick Brian Carroll, 1,300 pounds. If he makes a one millimeter mistake under 1,300 pounds and then corrects it with his back, he's in big trouble. But if you correct it through the ankles and the feet, just a little bit of a toe push, a little bit of a, a leaning tower athleticism through the feet, all of a sudden now you've spared the back and managed to pull off elite performance. So again, we get right back to, it may or may not be important for that person. Uh, uh, but then again, it may be critically, uh, critically important. So feet and hands, uh, absolutely. Well, yeah, there, the way, there's the way everything I, important at some well, point in time for, for someone somewhere. Well, and the way <laughs> I learned that is because we have so many, we have so many nerve endings, like, right? We have nerve endings between every joint and we have nerve endings between like, in every ligament. And so if you engage your hands properly, gripping or pushing on the floor or something, or p engage your feet into the floor, my understanding is you're sending more information up into the body. You're sending more data if you will. I, that's the way I kind of look at it, right? I look at the body as like a computer where the, the muscles and, and, the, and the skeletal structures and the fascia and all the connective tissues are the hardware. But the ultimate, it's, it's the brain and the nervous system, which is, our heart, which is our hard drive and our operating system. And the more data we can put into it, the better we can, we can use our hardware. Is that, is that one way of looking at it? Well, uh, it could be. 
again, it's an it depends kinds of a thing. And I'll give you an example of when we use bracketing. So bracketing will be a technique that allows us to hone in on what's best for an individual. So let's use the foot example. And someone comes in and they say, well, I want to lift a little bit more. And we'll see that their uh, athleticism in their feet is holding them back a little bit. And they'll say, well, what kind of shoes should I wear? I saw my friend uh, deadlifting in ballet slippers or bare feet, which has the advantage you don't have to lift uh, through such a high distance if you're lifting through higher lifting shoes. And then the next person comes in and says, my friend uses uh, a heel elevated Olympic shoe. Uh, what should I use? Because those are two very different. So uh, you would think that if the proprioceptive enhancement, which is what you're describing, uh, is an advantage, then everybody would do better lifting barefoot. But it doesn't work that way. Some people, yes. Some people, it's the polar opposite. So we'll uh, ask them to lift barefoot and make some measures, and then we'll bind their foot up with a heel elevated Olympic lifting shoe, tighten up the buckle and all the rest. Half of the people will do better with the rigid shoe where we starve out the proprioceptive feedback mm -hmm. and just stiffen the heck out of their foot. And uh, the other person will do much better feeling and comprehending and integrating the proprioceptive input. Um, but that bracket experiment shows us which way we're going to go. And then we might go to a, uh, you know, the, 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 they might say, let's try a Chuck uh, Taylor uh, kind of a shoe and, and go on from there. But we'll ba bracket back and forth and converge on what is optimal for that uh, particular person. So that, that was running through my head as you were describing that. But the second thing was going through my head was just getting back once again to what the Russians called the principle of irradiation. Mm. Now, if I took a uh, kettle, so let me just uh, pick up this kettle here, and I, I'm, I'm going to just stand uh, upright with it, and you could cap off my deltoid and feel it. And then all I'm going to do is squeeze the kettle, no more just squeeze the kettle. And if I squeeze to ultimate strength, slowly and surely, my shoulder will engage, my whole scapular carriage and trapezius will engage. In other words, I'm now learning to engage my whole body through that manual grip. So that is another strength enhancing technique. If I was doing a chin up uh, and I wanted to squeeze out a few more reps, just simply squeeze the bar even harder. And uh, with appropriate coaching, you should be able to enhance athleticism. So you will hear coaches in endurance sports, keep form, keep good form, don't break form. And quite often that comes with the discipline of don't get weak in the hands, stay tall, breathing deep, or whatever the, the, the event is. But uh, it's all part and parcel of the same principle. Well, and to give you feedback, I don't think I've told you this, Doc, um, but a couple of years ago when I interviewed you for the first time, you made the point of having a, a palms down, a pro, double pronated grip on the deadlift, on the barbell deadlift. For years, I'd used an over under, one hand being supinated, palms up, and the other hand being palms down, thinking that I didn't want the barbell to roll out of my grip. And, and after that first discussion, I changed to a bilateral, both hands pronated grip, palms down. Just some, I'm trying to use both terms so people listening, <laughs> so I don't lose the, the non-geeks in, in listening to it. But I have to tell you that it took a little bit getting used to, but being able to grip both hands to palm down really allowed me to get stronger through the deadlift and stronger through the pulls. So I didn't give you, I don't think I've told you that feedback. So I want to say thank you because I changed my lifting style and I can feel the strength in my lats. I can feel the strength in my shoulders simply by grabbing. And, and I think you described it as trying to bend the barbell, trying to twist that barbell in your hand and just really trying to, as you grip it, you're trying to pull it and trying to bend it. And that just creates so much more strength. That's why I wanted to bring that up about trying to tie the hands in. Now I want to shift gears a little bit because and we can come back to that if you need to, but I want to ask you a little bit about over the course of your research, you came up with a model of, of approaching exercise programs that goes through five different stages. And you, and you said that, that those could vary a little bit based on the needs of the individual. If we're looking at somebody, say somebody who's brand new and starting an exercise program, I believe you have the first stage is identifying quality movement engrams. 
Can you talk a little bit about what an engram is and why it's so important to establish that? I mean, for those of us that know this, you've kind of been talking about it all along, but I want to put it in context of somebody starting a program specifically to get stronger and why they would start with a phase, like in your phase one, developing a quality movement engram. Right. You'll, you'll notice that whenever I answer a question, it usually begins, well, it depends. Yeah, it could uh, go this way. It could go that way. But that's a horrible way to teach. So when I was teaching first year undergraduate students and I said, well, the answer is it depends. And they said, well, sir, what's going to be on the exam? That doesn't give <laughs> us any guidance. So, you know, when you're dealing with the fourth year student, when you say it depends, they say, ah, uh, yes, this is the answer for this individual. The opposite is the end. So that's why um, this, I, I had to put it into a system purely to teach it and make it comprehensible. So in the end, those five stages meld together and they, little, they disappear. But for the beginner, as you just pointed out in your question, we have to create a system to teach. So an engram. An engram is just a word from neuroscience and uh, consider it a muscle memory. So think of your brain as a tape. You don't think to walk. Your brain simply runs a tape. That is the engram for walking. So we have engrams that are established. Sometimes they're very appropriate. And sometimes they create stress concentrations that over time will lead to uh, an injury or you vary the speed or the load using the same engram and it doesn't work anymore. Or, or look at uh, what, what the engram that works for a child. A child is not a mini adult. They're entirely different with the ratio of the size of their head and their uh, shorter torso, and particularly shorter legs. But as they grow, their legs grow proportionately much longer. So the engrams have to change. We did a study uh, that I recall a little, uh, well, quite a number of years ago of police officers. And it was very interesting to watch them walk when they're off duty. They would walk off duty like this. And we wonder, well, why is that? And the engram or the muscle memory that they used on duty, well, they have a duty belt. They're carrying their gun, their, all their equipment. And so they have to walk and sit in the police cruiser like that. But that is the polluted, if you will, or inappropriate engram for just getting through life. So you corrupt engrams either through chronic exposure to a sport or a job. You corrupt an engram through injury. You begin to limp. And even when you get better, your brain is still remembering that limped uh, pattern. Um, or uh, the, the, the emotions can change engrams. You look at me now. I'm going to sit upright. And if you're reading body English, you are looking at a very competent, uh, confident type of a posture. Now, what, what, what am I portraying to you? Yeah, with your shoulders hunched over and your head dropped, you're very unsure, very uh, a lack of confidence. Lack of I'm, I'm showing you, if you get a textbook on clinical psychology, I've just given you the posture, which is a marker for chronic depression. Mm -hmm. Now, look at the stress on the discs of my spine. Do you see how I'm getting depressed about my back pain and uh, it feeds my back pain even more? I get even more depressed and I just... So do you see there is a corrupted engram, totally in inappropriate for uh, becoming robust and confident and back to enjoying life, but it was corrupted by emotions. Uh, social situations will uh, corrupt engrams. So we can go through the full litany of uh, force drivers on why people move certain ways, and it's the way that they move that will determine whether they're competent and confident and resilient and all the rest of it. Well, and how long would it take to establish? If we want to establish an engram, say, of good posture or just being able to hold say a side plank because i know the side plank is one of your kind of foundational movements and, and and if we want to if somebody is like okay i really want to work on getting strong this year how long should they work on creating those basic foundational engrams how and i, and I know real quick i can kind of see the little impish smile appearing on your face and, and what i love about this so is for listeners this is the point in the podcast because i think every time i interview somebody with, with your credentials doc where you have a DR in your name or you've been studying something for years, 
there is no i think listeners sometimes get frustrated because there is no definitive answer it's going to be different for every individual based on the evidence that you observe and and it's like you you cannot give an answer until you have a case in front of you and you can observe what happens but just in, in general for somebody that's asymptomatic without any chronic pain or any chronic chronic myopathy what could they expect in terms of i just want to develop more stability from the inside out in terms of developing engrams pete it depends <laughs> so let me give Hello. some examples i i can think of one of the greatest mixed martial artists of all time if you look up his name on on youtube that people are arguing whether he's the greatest of all time if you verbally told him what career direction or movement change you wanted, he would give it to you and it would never be questioned or, or flubbed up again. It would be perfect. So there is an example of a simple verbal command once changed the engram. Isn't that spectacular? Now there's a reason why that individual became the person that he did. There are other people who are what I call unidimensional athletes. All they do is throw a baseball 100 miles an hour, or they hit a golf ball, but don't ask them to swim, or they are the fastest swimmer in their country, and yet they can't do a single push up. And, and I've had that patient before, the world record holder breast in freestyle swimming, uh, their, their top Olympian really struggled to do a push up, hmm. meaning that they didn't have the engrams that were transferable from one to another. Now, just off the top of your head, do you think it would be easy or difficult to change that movement behavior and establish a new engram in that kind of a person? Oh, well, that individual, they're working on a very high end hard drive. So it wouldn't be, I don't think it would be that hard. Just a little bit of problem. No, it'd be very difficult. Oh, what? They are a, oh yes. They're oh, wow. a unidimensional athlete. And um, a golfer is a person who does the same thing over and over again. And they are an elastic athlete. A uh, When you deal with uh, sports medicine docs, who go to the Olympics for their country and they are responsible for their entire team of Olympians. And you say to them, who's the best athlete? Wow, what a question and what conversations you can have. And it's interesting how quite a number of them have converged on a team sport and more than one have said to me, a basketball player. Hmm. And I've worked with a few of, of, the, of the great ones and they can change direction. They have a team court development IQ, situational IQ that is phenomenal. Uh, they have fabulous lateral movement. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're just, you, you can throw them into anything. Now, let's take a triathlon that starts out with a long swim, a bike, and then a run. How many people do you know who win the swim and then win the triathlon? It very rarely occurs because the athleticism that causes you to be the fastest fish means you have big floppy ankles and you've turned your feet into flippers and you can pull water and do all of these kinds of things, but you're not the running sparky athlete that runs on springs like a kangaroo. They are two completely polar opposite athleticisms. Get off the bike and try running and you feel like a motor moron for the first uh, kilometer or so because of the change in engram that's required. So my point in all of this is uh, the best athletes are the ones who have a broad spectrum of challenges that they must meet. Uh, the unidimensional athletes uh, really don't. So again, a, a swimmer, for example, um, probably isn't going to be the best on the basketball court, but a basketball player, chances are they can play other team sports, they can run, uh, they can do, do you see what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. And that, yeah. that becomes kind of a common theme that I try to hit on in the podcast as well, because a lot of my listeners probably have kids that play sports and I really, I always appreciate it. I, Mike Boyle and I had this conversation for a while about why it's so important to have kids play different sports. And I've talked about this with other coaches and other strength coaches because you get so much stimulus and I'll share with you, then I want to shift on to the next, to the next phase in, in your, in your model or, or talk about the next kind of thing. But I'll share with you, doc, what I'm trying to do with, with my daughters 
is before COVID kind of shut everything down, I'm trying to get them more into that. They do those um, Ninja Warrior programs where they do the obstacle courses. That's what I'm trying to encourage my daughters to do before they get into team sports. You know, they're still relatively young in elementary school, and I'm trying to encourage them. I'm like, hey, why don't we do, why don't you do dance? Why don't you do the Ninja Warrior? As opposed, I'm not worried about them playing soccer or anything like that yet, because I want them to be skilled moves in their whole body before I have them go and do one repetitive sport, even though soccer is a very multi-skilled sport. That's just is taking the information that I, that I know. And it's because I want them to have different skills, just as you mentioned. Now, the next phase in your model, you've established an engram and you kind of create quality movement. The next phase gets into whole body and joint stability. And what I have here is stability while sparing joints. You, you have in, 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 your, in your textbook, stability while sparing joints. And I want you to talk a little bit about that because I think, again, I I'm thinking about the average person who goes to the gym and they might be using a machine without really thinking about how everything works together. And so with, with your phrase, stability while sparing joints, you know, what, what's that, what's that, how do we apply that in a real world model? Okay, well, let's, uh, I'm sorry, but we, we have to go to a mechanical engineering uh, <laughs> analogy and, and a lesson here. So I've already used this model to show that when you have joint laxity, application of a shear force or a twist force creates a pain producing aberrant micro movement. And I've talked about the neurological implications of that and all the rest of it. So, uh, my particular, and people come to me for, for back pain, but uh, let me continue on with a back pain uh, example of this. So I'm going to take a dowel and I'm going to form what an engineer calls a three point bend. So assume this is a bridge. We hold up one end of the bridge with a support abutment and the other end of the bridge is held up. And now we're going to drive traffic across the bridge. Do you see how this forms a mechanical three point bend? one support up, two supports up, and the third point is down, creating a bending load on this support. You can bend the spine, but that's not going to create the shear trigger. A shear trigger comes from a cantilever. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to lay on the floor now, and I'm going to do a side plank. I'll just can you see me okay, Pete? Do you see yep. that I've, I've created a three-point bend? Support one coming through my elbow, support two coming through my feet, and here's the third bend down. So I'm resisting bending, but there is no shear load on my spine. You don't get into shear loads until you uh, create what's called a cantilever. So now, there's the three-point bend. I'm now going to hold the rod like this and create a jib crane cantilever. Hmm. Do you see now that that is creating a bending load, but it's also creating a shear load through the rod? You got it? Yep. It's like, so going, now, just real quick, I'm going to describe it for listeners. It's like holding, he's holding a dowel rod like he would have a fishing line at the end so that the one end is held by his hands and there's a torque or a force on the other end creating a bending. Do I have that correct? Correct. Okay. So do you see that if I do a deadlift or a good morning, that's causing my rib cage to shear forward on my pelvis. If I have that little joint laxity from a disc bulge or a little bit of a flattened disc, I've just triggered pain. Now let's take a different mode now. Let's take a pal off press. So I'll take a cable and I will straighten it. But do you see, yes, it's creating me uh, a twisting torque, but it's also shearing my upper body mm. across my left. Do you now see why the side plank didn't allow shear? It was a tolerable challenge for the person who had that lax joint and uh, shear triggered instability. So there's a little bit of a start, but you have to have an engineering discussion. And now we start subcategorizing exercises into those that are tolerable and not tolerable based on the very specific pain trigger of that person. And that pain trigger knowledge comes from the assessment. Well, and, and let's stay on that for a second, because I think this is important because a lot of people out there, myself included, sometimes have a little bit of a, wow, that doesn't feel right in an exercise. So in that case, 
and I'll use myself as an example, say my back is flaring up a little bit and I had surgery a number of years ago, I can still exercise, but I wanna avoid what causes pain, right? Because I can still move around that. I don't wanna do anything to, I don't wanna work through the pain because working through the pain might lead to further injury, whereas I can back down the intensity and maybe I was doing an exercise where I was moving in multiple planes of motion, but now to use this example, because the side plank is perfect. On those days that my back does bother me, I'll revert to glute bridges where I lay on the ground and, and push my hips up in the air, or like a, a what do they call it? What's Brett contrary hip thrust, the hip thrust, or I'll do a side plank. I won't do anything like a squat or anything that where it's moving in multiple directions because it allows me to strengthen my body without really putting any unnecessary torques on it. So I want people to know that it is possible to strengthen, but you just have to move away from pain. Is that kind of one way to look at that? Exactly. And you will also be able to uh, create a training program where the volume matters. Um, can you still hear me, by the way? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought my uh, sound went off for a moment. But um, yes, so uh, training volume now becomes part of your management uh, program to make sure that you're building rather than being torn down. So maybe you do want to do uh, a deadlift, but you can only do it once a week. Mm. Um, for example, you know, I love kettlebell swings. I've, I've loved them ever since I met Pavel Satsulin, who you, you probably know is the, the great guru who brought uh, kettlebells to uh, the U.S. But uh, I love kettlebell swings. But, you know, I've had some spine injury and a, a bit of scoliosis, etc. I have a tolerance. If I train kettlebell swings three times a week, uh, I will... Uh, get into a little bit of trouble. So uh, a little bit, however, once a week is uh, fabulous for creating the pulsing strength that is so convertible to many different types of athletic expressions. Well, and I, and I love that. And I want to respect your time. So we'll wrap up here pretty quickly. Um, but I do want to jump ahead a little bit. Um, well, number one, I like that what you said, because you don't, I think a lot of people and Americans, especially Stu, I will, I'll qualify this because you're in Canada, but Americans, especially, I think sometimes if we're not, we think that if we're not in pain or discomfort, that we're not exercising correctly. When in reality, you can still challenge the body to grow by just challenging it to work harder than it might be used to. And you can do one or two really hard training days a week, but still move the other days of the week where you're not, maybe not overloading the tissues. Um, would that be, I mean, is, I know there's a different, you're going to come back to that depends because there are many different answers with that. But when you look at that, how do you, when you look at like developing an overall training program for general fitness, how many days a week out of a seven day week, would you recommend maybe doing stuff that's pretty hard or pretty heavy? All right. The answer is it depends. Yeah. And I can't get away from that because it's the biological truth. Yeah, I agree. Um, so the first part to converge on which depends we're talking about here is I have to ask, what are the goals? So I, it's tragic. I get far too many young people here who've ruined their back doing excessive deadlifts, either in terms of trying to reach a personal best with poor form and their coach didn't understand that they'd been building trauma in their back faster than their body was adapting and creating the repair process. So the cumulative trauma ran ahead of the rate of the repair and they're gonna really suffer now for a few years. Um, however, uh, well, we just had Brian Carroll, who uh, I wrote a book called Gift of Injury. He just set the world all-time, all-weight category uh, squat record, uh, as an example, of 1,306 pounds. But Brian came to me in 2013, seven years ago, with a massive uh, fracture in uh, his L5, very badly damaged discs and whatnot. But he was such a professional that he slowly built. He took the first year to do bone callusing and readapt his tissues and remodel them. No lifting at all. It was very humbling doing the big three, um, very light uh, suitcase carries, uh, 
maybe one day out of uh, three or five fulfilling the bone callusing procedure. And then after the first year, he, he was out of pain very quickly. Uh, he then slowly rebuilt his athleticism back to setting uh, the world record again. He had held the world record previous to uh, uh, 2013, by the way. But uh, there's just an example of uh, he had to lift heavy. There's no question about it. But if I if I then said to the person, so your goal is to want to set a world, uh, sorry, a personal best in uh, deadlift. Let me ask you a question. You do realize that every personal best deadlift record you set, you've shortened your athletic career. You don't see many in the Masters Olympics uh, who were uh, very athletic when they were younger because all of the young athletes are now uh, compromised in their body and they can't train to that level. So when we get Masters athletes here, most of them uh, were not the Olympians. They were the ones who spared their bodies and found athletics later in their life, which is so interesting. So I play a game with them and I say, yeah, you want your next personal best. Let me ask you a question. How about if I made a deal with you and I said, the goal here is really to be the best rocking 80 year old grandmother or grandfather you could possibly be. How would that goal grab you? And if they say, you know, I've never thought of it that way. That's what I want. I want to retire with no pain and I want to uh, have the, uh, the, the best athleticism to play with my grandchildren. I said, well, I uh, hate to tell you, but deadlifts are the wrong exercise for you. It's the wrong tool. Uh, the people who live the longest, uh, when you look, these are people who live in the blue zone, who keep their health the longest, uh, live and eat like them, and you will be uh, increasing your chance of being the most rocking 80 year old. Can I tell you a short story about sure, myself? Sure, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm in my middle 60s. Pete, I have no pain. I move well. I feel fabulous. But I, I've got quite an injury history. I've broken my neck, my clavicle, uh, uh, C4, L4. I've broken my hips. I've had hip replacement, wow. uh, my hands, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, the point is if you would have said to me when I was 30, you're gonna retire with no pain. I never would have believed you, but I used to train heavy uh, and I would have my aches and pains thinking that I was becoming better, but what did it matter? Now I train what I call the biblical training week. I get up every day at a certain time and I do my chores around here, a lot of heavy uh, manual work, just if I'm not chopping firewood or whatever, it, it's a lot of manual work. Two days a week, I will strength train if I haven't done any strength demands that particular week. So two days a week, I'll dedicate to a little strength training routine. Two days a week, I work on mobility, the things that are a bit stuck. I have to work on my neck, my shoulders, and my hips, uh, my thoracic spine. I don't want to be that bent over old man, et cetera. And I never had to even think about mobility in my 30s, but it's important to me now. And I don't push the end range. I work throughout the range of motion, but I don't push the end range. I strategically stretch things like my psoas muscle, as an example. Two days a week, I do something for my ticker, which means I do something else. Like today, for example, I might go cross-country skiing. In the summer, I might go down to the lake and go for a swim or a bike ride. And then the seventh day, I don't do anything that day. That is my day for adaptation. Now, this is anti-American. Americans think more is better. And it breaks my heart when someone will show me a social media post where, oh, on my rest day, I just ran out five kilometers. And I thought, oh, this kid is so lost. You train to create adaptations in your body. You've got to let the adaptations uh, occur. Anyway, there's a seven day training cycle. I feel fabulous. I adapt. I'm not overweight. I have wonderful mobility. Uh, I've, I've hit the sweet spot. It's, but it's taken a lot of years to, to gain that wisdom. Well, and, and, and Don, I just want to say, I want to give you a huge hug right now, a huge virtual hug, because that's exactly the type of programming I advocate is doing two, maybe three days a week of picking up something heavy, depending on sleep and nutrition and hydration, two, maybe three days a week of mobility training, 
on those weeks that maybe you can't pick up enough heavy stuff, you add an extra day of mobility training, and then two or maybe three days a week of something to get that heart rate up and get you sweating and always taking one day a week off. You know, obviously I, I build some flexibility in there because there might be some weeks where you feel great and you want to do a third strength workout, whereas there might be other weeks when getting two strength workouts is in there. But the reason why I mention that is I think that we use a lot of, the, you've done a lot, you've done the lab work. I've done no work in the lab. I just read all the studies in the books that you write. And that's where I've developed this kind of thought process over the years. And I want listeners to hear that, that we're coming at it, we're, we're coming at it from like different viewpoints, but we're kind of getting to the, sen, the same, um, the same destination of just being active, but being active in a smart way. Now, the one final question, you know, and I know I've, I've taken up your time and I appreciate that. But the one thing I want to ask before we, we end the discussion today is over the course of your years doing research, was there anyone in the studies that kind of caused you to go, hmm, and really made you that surprised you? Was there any study that you did where the outcome was maybe different than what you thought going into it? Yeah, many. Oh, really? That many? Okay. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. And sometimes okay. our failed experiments were the ones that we uh, learned the most from. Okay. Yeah. So I wasn't sure I, if you I, were... I can think of uh, going back to 1994. I was a visiting professor at the medical school in Bern, Switzerland that year. It was a sabbatical year for me. And uh, we were implanting intramuscular electrodes into the deep muscles of the spine, muscles that had never been measured before. Hmm. And no one really knew how the brain activated them. And talk about engrams is <laughs> right back to where we started from here. And we, put, we planted two electrodes. We would go through the erector spinae through quadratus lumborum and into the psoas with a posterior entry. And uh, a couple of times the wires on one of the pair would pull back into quadratus lumborum. No one had ever measured from quadratus lumborum before. It was a pure mistake, but we got five people and we learned about their, their QL activation that, that we uh, never would have known if that had not been a, uh, uh, an error. So there's uh, one example. Um, you just told the story about uh, we converged in the middle. You learned in your laboratory, which is the gym and the experience and whatnot. And uh, we learned through the various uh, methods that, that we used. Uh, th two years ago, um, you, you've heard of Bill Kazmaier, World's yeah, Strongest. Yeah, yeah. I actually met years. him once a number of years ago in Alaska. Yeah. Yeah, well. Big, ha big hands. Huge Bill, hands. Bill is a fabulous personality. Yeah. Um, I was uh, at, at a uh, conference. It was a, uh, the Swiss conference, Society for Weight Training um, Swiss. Uh, I forget the, what, it, what it stands for. It's like Ken Kanakins. That's Ken it Kanakins. is. It's, it's Ken That's... Kanakins' outfit. So Ken, yeah. we were at the uh, finishing up banquet, and Ken said, we're going to give a Lifetime Achievement Award. And uh, I shouldn't tell us about Ken, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, this next guy has contributed to our understanding of uh, training and athleticism and whatnot. Uh, Professor McGill, would you come up? And I was flabbergasted. I never thought in a million years. And then I get this award and he hands me a note. Would you please introduce the next uh, <laughs> Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Bill Kazmaier. Tell a story. <laughs> What I've been put on the spot now, and I'm in front of the podium and on, on a, a, in in front of the huge uh, 100 people, and I look over at Bill, and he's sitting there, and uh, so I told this story, and it was just one that was just off the top of my head, and I said, well, I've been asked to introduce this next award winner, and I didn't mention his name, and I said he trained and uh, was known for being the strongest. Well, people started to figure out right away it was Bill Kazmar. And I said, you know, I would uh, go to him and I would watch him train a specific exercise. And I said, you know, it's so interesting, Bill, but that's exactly how we activate all the neuromuscular compartments of the back. How did you know that that is the way to do it? Because the physical therapists were telling people, oh, swell up your multifidus and activate from medial to lateral. But the brain doesn't organize the back muscles that way. The back is organized with neuromuscular compartments up and down the back. So Bill would do little cantilever exercises exercises up and down his back. How did you know that that's how the brain did it? And he looked at me and he said, Stu, I only did what knew worked. 
isn't that a beautiful confluence of some good science and then the guy who's the best in the world and they both came so that was the story that i told i don't but anyway isn't that a lovely confirmation of uh science and will real world application and experience all coming together and and when you work with great people you'll find such fabulous um convergence well that's what i like i mean honestly and, and selfishly doc that's one of the reasons why i do this podcast is to have these conversations and and you've been on the lecture circuit enough to know that these are the conversations that we'll have in the evening at the bar after you know after we've been talking all day and we'll, we'll sit down and and have dinner together have, have have you know drink together and we have these conversations and that's what i wanted to try to bring to the audience is to hear these stories and and not only do you hear the science and your research but the, the application and being able to learn from athletes like Bill Kazmaier. Now, I, I, and I want to, you know, I don't want to keep you too much longer because you said you have a couple of things planned for afterwards, but how can people learn more information? I know you have a couple books, you have a number of books out and you have a ton of research out, but what do you have, what, what do you have available that if people want to learn more about core training or they want to learn more about what you're doing with BackFit Pro, how can people access that information? Well, I'm not uh, much for social media, I'm afraid. Um, however, uh, we have our website, backfitpro.com, and uh, I have some of the thoughts that we discussed on the resources there. If someone's struggling with their back, we have our uh, McGill Method Certified Clinicians, and we have some master clinicians on there uh, as well. Um, but uh, I wrote my textbook, which I think you have, Low Back Disorders, for the clinical community quite a number of years ago, and I think it's in third edition now. But people would read that and they say, you wrote this for docs, could you write a book that we could consume as the lay public? And I never thought I would do this, Pete, but it was the hardest darn book I ever wrote. It was called Back Mechanic. And uh, uh, again, I put it into a system of a step-by-step -step approach to guide the person through a self-assessment of their pain triggers and then based on their self-assessment, show them what to do and not do to wind down their pain and then build a foundation for pain-free movement. Then uh, a book I had actually written before that, Ultimate Back Fitness and Performance, this is now we have to switch. You're out of pain, but you want to regain some of your athleticism and really start to enjoy life again. So that is the uh, second uh, level, and hopefully people will get there once they get out of uh, pain. Well, and, and that's exactly, but, but Stu, that's exactly why I wanted to start off in January having this conversation with you, because I know every year, this time of year, people are like, I want to get back to the gym. And, and even though with all COVID going on and everything, they, they, people are like recommitting back to their fitness program. And my observation and my knowledge is that a lot of times people will stop because they might get injured or they might get discouraged because they might be in pain. And that's exactly why I wanted to have this conversation with you today is because I want people to hear the fact that they don't need to be in pain and that there are solutions for getting out of pain and that people like yourself and specifically the work that you've done, Stu, is probably one of the best resources. If people go to back uh, to BackFit Pro and pick up one of your books, that can be one of the best resources for learning how to exercise without being in pain. I mean, I, I shared with you before, I had a really bad back injury from playing rugby as a young man. And one of the reasons why I started reading your research and why I started studying the work that you do was that so I could be injury free. And then I've just shared that knowledge with other people throughout my career. So that's why it's always a pleasure to have this, con this type of conversation with you. Well, Pete, it goes both ways. Uh, the way you frame your questions are fabulous, and I can tell you've been there. So th thank you for your support, and thank you for all that you do for uh, uh, people as well. Oh, thank you, Doc. Well, with that, I'm going to let you get back out. You said you're going to go snow machining today. Whether you're <laughs> snow, snow machining or cross-country skiing, that's kind of irrelevant to me here in Carlsbad. I think today is kind of an off day, so I'm going to take the, my bulldog for a walk around the neighborhood. <laughs> that's all I got going on. So thank you for your time, Dr. McGill. I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks again for all you do, Pete. Good luck.